This is another sign of the times, an analysis and a commentary. What is a Goldilocks planet? At least four times in the last few years, astronomers have announced they have found planets orbiting other stars in the sweet spot known as a habitable zone. Not too hot, not too cold, where water and thus perhaps life is possible. In short, a planet fit to be inhabited by the biochemical likes of us, a so-called Goldilocks planet. Of course, none of these claims are without controversy, but astronomers who are making discoveries with NASA's Kepler spacecraft are meeting next week in California to review the first two years of their quest, which seems tantalizingly close to hitting pay dirt. Sooner or later, Kepler should find a lukewarm planet with a size making it probably Earth-like, said Geoffrey Marcy of the University of California, Berkeley, who spends his time tracking down candidates identified by Kepler. We're no more than a year away from such a discovery, he said. Sarah Seeger, a planetary astronomer at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, put it this way, We are on the verge of being those people who will be remembered. All this has brought to the fore a question long debated by geologists, chemists, paleontologists, and cosmologists turned astrobiologists. Namely, what does life really need to get going, flourish, and evolve on some alien rock? The answer depends, of course, on whom we expect to be living there. We might dream of green men with big eyes, ants with hive minds, or even cuddly octopuses as an antidote to cosmic loneliness. But what we are most likely to find, a growing number of scientists say, is some alien pond slime. In other words, microbes. And microbes can spring up anywhere that is wet and warm, astronomers say, although biologists are not so sure that the emergence of large creatures let alone intelligent ones, as evidenced by the history of the Earth, depends on a chain of events and so-called accidents, from asteroid strikes to plate tectonics, that are unlikely to be repeated any time soon. If you reran Earth's history, how many times would you get animals? Said Donald Brownlee, an astronomer at the University of Washington. He and a colleague, Peter Ward, made a case that we live on a so-called lucky planet in their 1999 book, Rare Earth. Single-cell life might be common, given the right simple conditions, but the steady, long-term evolution toward beings or creatures that play improv saxophone, write poems, and build heavy-lifting rocket boosters may depend on a prohibitive list of planetary requirements. Even warm and wet is a rare condition, however, occurring now on only one of the eight official planets in our solar system and three of the several dozen moons. Mars was once wet, but now it seems to be a desert. And after billions of dollars spent exploring Mars and the remains of space probes littering the planet, we still do not know if a single microbe ever lived there. But nobody really knows how rare or common are plants like Earth and its brand of life. In other words, it might be very rare indeed. I would be more comfortable with that argument if it were not so Earth-ocentric. A chemist at the Foundation for Molecular Evolution said, for instance, he said, low temperature water mixed with ammonia can substitute for water alone as a liquid necessary for life, at least theoretically. So could liquid methane which forms lakes on Titan, Saturn's slushy frigid moon, and Dr. Benner and others have advocated looking for life there. We are limited by our imaginations, said a leader of the Kepler team. Some scientists deplore the emphasis on animals like us, saying it is hopelessly parochial and unimaginative, the scientific equivalent of the drunk searching for his car keys under a street light because that's where the light is. Animals are overgrown microbes, said
instead a biophysicist and biologist from Rutgers. We are here to ferry microbes across the planet. Plants and animals are an afterthought of microbes. So, we should hardly be disappointed if we find our neighbors are microbes. After all, on Earth, microbes were the whole story for almost four billion years. Scientists say a blue ribbon committee of chemists convened by the National Academy of Sciences concluded that there was only one ironclad requirement for life besides energy, a place warm enough for chemical reactions to go on. So, determining how warm a planet's atmosphere keeps it through assumptions, calculations, or just plain guesses has been crucial in reaching a verdict about its potential habitability in September what some astronomers called the best and smallest Goldilocks candidate yet was announced by the Geneva team. Some 3.6 times as massive as the Earth, it circles a faint orange star in Vela, known as HD 85512, at a distance of some 24 million miles, about a quarter of the Earth's distance from the Sun. Scientists have calculated that this planet would be habitable if it had an Earth-type geology and at least 50% cloud cover. So, so far we only have two great targets to search for atmospheric signatures of life. And so goes the history of astrobiology as well as its future. The problem, as many astronomers point out, is getting any more information about these planets. Astronomers are going to have to learn to live with ignorance Dr. Seeger said, Some exoplanets were discovered by the wobble method, looking at the motions they induce in their parent stars, which allows their masses and orbits to be measured. Other planets, like the ones identified by Kepler, are found by watching for the blinks when they pass in front of their stars. That also allows their sizes to be determined. To date, none of the Goldilocks candidates have been observed to transit their stars, and thus none have been assigned both masses and sizes, which would allow astronomers to calculate their densities and compositions and find out if they are water worlds, rocks, or gassy fluff balls. Kepler fixes its gaze on a patch of stars in Cygnus that are hundreds if not thousands of light years away, too far for any wobble detections that would assess the abundance of Earth-like planets in the galaxy or any other close scrutiny. We are liable to never know any more about those planets than we know now, astronomers say. The brute reality, astronomers admit, is that even if there are thousands or millions of habitable planets in the galaxy, only a few hundred of them are within range of any telescope that might be built in the conceivable future. In the original scheme of things, Kepler was to be succeeded by a space observatory called the Terrestrial Planet Finder, which would be big enough to find and study planets up to 100 light years distant. But plans for that telescope have collapsed because of NASA's continuing fiscal woes and disagreements among astronomers, as well as the technological challenges involved. Some scientists hope that some of these functions can be performed by the James Webb Space Telescope, NASA's Hubble successor, overdue and over budget, now scheduled for a launch in 2018. Equipped with a starshade that would blot out the glare of a planet's sun, the Webb could detect and study the pinpoint of light from an exoplanet itself, but the starshade would be hostage to the same political and fiscal pressures that are threatening to decimate NASA's scientific programs. At best, scientists say, the search for life elsewhere has been postponed for decades. I'm beginning to despair that I will see it in my lifetime, said James Casting of Pennsylvania State University. Some say Earth got lucky early. Fossil evidence suggests that microbial life was already inhabiting the Earth as early as 3.8 billion years ago only 700 million years after the planet collapsed into existence, in a geological instant after the end of a reign of comets and asteroids 
that brought just the right amount of precious water in the form of ice from the outer solar system to what would otherwise be a dry planet. So, the question of whether the Earth is unique because of its water abundance is perhaps the most interesting one in the arsenal of rare Earth arguments, said Dr. Casting, who explained that calculations showed that the planet could have easily been swamped too much or too little water. In other words, it was just right. The planet has remained comfortable ever since thanks to a geological feedback process by which weather, oceans, and volcanoes act as a thermostat. Known as the carbonate silicate cycle, it regulates the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, where it acts like a greenhouse, trapping heat and keeping the planet temperate and mostly stable. Rain washes the gas out of the air and under the ocean. Volcanoes disgorge it again from the underworld. Without greenhouse gases and this cycle, which Dr. Brownlee called this magic thing, the earth would have frozen into a snowball back in its early days when the sun was only 70% as bright as it is now. Still, with this so-called magic, it took 4 billion years for animal life to appear on the earth. The seeds for animal life were sown sometime in the dim past when some bacterium learned to use sunlight to split water molecules and produce oxygen and sugar, photosynthesis. In short, the results began to kick in 2.4 billion years ago and the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere began to rise dramatically. The great oxidation event, as it is called in geology, was clearly the biggest event in the history of the biosphere. It culminated in what is known as the Cambrian Explosion some 550 million years ago when multicellular creatures, that is to say, animals or creatures, appeared in a sudden spectacular profusion in the fossil record. So, whatever happened to cause this flowering of species helped elevate Earth someplace special, say the rare Earthers, someplace very special indeed. In other words, alien planets that have been so-called lucky enough to be habitable in the first place might have to be lucky again. The big hurdle for other planets, said Dr. Brownlee, is to have some event or series of events to trigger their own Cambrian-like explosions. Eventually, though, Earth will get old. As the sun ages, it will get brighter, astronomers say, increasing the weathering and washing away of carbon dioxide. At the same time, as the interior of the Earth cools, volcanic activity will gradually subside, cutting off the replenishing of the greenhouse gas a billion or so years from now. Dr. Brownlee said there will not be enough carbon dioxide left to support photosynthesis, that is to say, the oxygen we breathe. So, humankind's destiny is to go to the stars and colonize the galaxy and the cosmos. Again, Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth too, and the earth was without form and void darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. 3. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. 4. And God saw the light, but it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. 5. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. 6. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. 7. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. 8. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. 9. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, let the dry land appear, and it was so. 10. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. This too is another sign of the end times, transition days, which is a time of extraordinary changes, happenings, and events. It's time now.
everything is connected and everything is numbered. It's also called fate or destiny.